a dire warning and a call for urgent action on climate change. And it comes from a panel of UN experts who say that time is running out to prevent global warming from reaching a catastrophic milestone. Now, the group says that by the year 2030, that's just 12 years from now, the Earth could warm to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That forecast is based on current greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to fight it, the UN says massive changes are needed in several areas, including the energy sector in cities. So what does all this mean potentially for millions of us across the globe? Now, increased risk of extreme drought, floods, as well as food shortages. Let's bring in our meteorologist Chad Myers. He joins us from the CNN World Weather Center. And Chad, this new UN report, it, it paints this frightening timeline and picture of the immediate consequences of climate change. Walk us to the report. Yeah, a very sobering report on what would happen to the Earth at 2.0 degrees Celsius higher than pre-industrial compared to 1.5. 1.5, we can save the Earth. 2.0, they're not so sure. Uh, 2.0 looks like all of the coral reefs would be completely decimated worldwide. So here's where we are. They're saying now is the time to stop this. We don't have another decade to wait. It needs to stop now. We need to stop polluting the atmosphere and do it right away. We're already up. We're already at 1.0 above where we were before we started burning fossil fuel. So we already know that from ice cores and all kinds of other things. But the three hottest years on record have been the past three years. So we're just going the wrong direction. And we know these things are going to happen with global warming. There's strong evidence about heat waves, coastal flooding, of course, floods, and of course, drought. The biggest thing that I concern myself with at this point in time is starvation. If we have crop failure and we lose crops, we have 9 billion people worldwide to feed. It's global warming, not local or somewhere regional warming. It's all across the globe. We need to get carbon neutral, and how do we do that? If we get to be that by 2047, we have a 66% chance of staying at 1.5 or less. Now, how do we do that? How do you stop running cars, lorries, everything around the world to move food products, to make products? Well, somewhere between 2030 and 2050, we need to cut these emissions by 100%. That's a sobering number because, you know, I have a teenager and my world and his world will look nothing alike if we don't mm -hmm. get this stopped. We need to even start capturing some of this CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we remove some of this carbon if possible. And that would help stop to bring these carbon levels down from the 406 parts per billion all the way up into maybe somewhere, keep it at 400 or get it lower than that. But right now that technology doesn't exist, at least not in a big enough fashion to capture all of the CO2 coming out of every exhaust pipe, driving around the world right now or flying around the atmosphere right now. It is a sobering assessment of what's to come. There have been so many other things going on, including all of these worldwide plagues, worldwide floods, worldwide droughts. And we're now up to 335 somewhere disasters in the past 10 years. This is their assessment. It comes out quite often, but this is one that's like, hey, you guys need to get off the accelerator and fix this. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very dire forecast of our changing planet. Chad Myers reporting. Thank you so much. You're Joining welcome. us now is Jim Ski. He is a co-chair of the UN Working Group that produced this study. And Jim, thank you for joining us. You know, according to this thank study, you. we could reach catastrophic climate change by the year 2030. That's just around the corner. When you worked on this report, were you shocked to find out that time is truly running out? Well, uh, I, I don't think, we, I think we well understood uh, that time was coming out. I mean, I think the significance of the report is actually this wasn't scientific, you know, scientists rising up. This is a report that was actually asked for by governments under the Paris Agreement. They said that they wanted to pursue efforts to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And so they didn't really know how to do it. They asked the IPCC what were the implications in terms of the difference between 1.5 and, and 2 degrees and what would it take to limit global warming to 1.5. And two years later, we've come along with a report and we've given them very unambiguous messages about the difference between the two levels of warming and very unambiguous messages as well about just what it would take to get you, what, how 
far we have to go in getting emissions down. Now, whether that's feasible or not, you know, it's not a question we've tried to answer because at the end it comes down to political will and what governments, et cetera, are willing to do. So we've passed the report on to governments. They're going to get together in Poland later in the year to talk about the next steps. And our report is the only named input into their negotiations. So really, it's moving over to governments at this stage. We've sent a very clear set of messages to them. This does come down to political will, but let's look at the political reality. We have U.S. President Donald Trump, who has pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. He's not alone. There are a number of other world leaders who oppose meaningful climate change action. So how do you reverse this political reality? Yeah, I mean, what, what, the, report, what the report did was it added up all, all the pledges that uh, governments had made uh, after the Paris Agreement. And it reaches the clear conclusion that this is going to take us to emissions by 2030 that are way above the level that we need to get them to if we're going to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 or for that matter, two degrees uh, uh, level of warming. So although there, issue, the, you, there might be issues with the United States and its relationship to the Paris Agreement, the, the pledge is that all countries made under Paris don't actually add up at the moment. And everybody needs to step up in terms of ambition. And that's what they need to think about in, in Poland in, in December. But obviously, you know, with a country like the United States, you know, with, with its large level of emissions, it is troubling you know, when somebody pulls out of an agreement like this. Though some other countries have said, we'll step in, in and make up the difference. Right. We, we need nations to step up to have a political rethink here. Do we also need an economic rethink? Because right now, economic growth is based on rising consumption. Do we need a new approach to how we consider economic growth? Well, I, that's something that's debated between scientists. And I have to say this particular report didn't get into this issue. And what it did demonstrate is actually pretty, pretty much conventional growth, uh, growth uh, methods of having economic growth could be compatible with 1.5 degrees if you were willing to, uh, you know, kind of change the technologies you were going to apply, speed up the deployment of renew renewable energy, move to electrification of transportation, you know, electric vehicles rather than, r rather than gasoline vehicles. So, so that kind of thing could really make a difference. But one thing the report, you know, that the scientific scientists are trying to do now is actually to think about different patterns of growth and what it would mean for uh, reaching ambitious targets. And one of the messages that comes out of that is if we are willing to think about different ways of consuming, different ways of behaving, then it re reduces the pressure for difficult technologies that might take carbon dioxide out of the air later in the 21st century. Because one of the things our report has done, it's flagged really important issues about what carbon dioxide removal might do for land, the implications for food security and the implication for biodiversity and ecosystems. So taking carbon dioxide out of the air isn't a magic solution. It comes its own problems that comes with it. Yeah, and we need to figure out how to act to avoid an increasingly um, warming planet. And we have, according to your report, just over a decade to do so. Jim Ski of the IPCC, thank you so much for joining us here on the program.